if you look them up in the table, you'll see that this is glycine and this is alanine. Glycine has a single hydrogen as its side chain, and alanine has a methyl group as its side chain. So suppose we did a total acid hydrolysis. What would the computer say? What would, that, what would pop out of the computer? From this dipeptide. That's just a straightforward question. What amino acids would the computer see? It would see glycine, glycine. and alanine. These are not any of our problem amino acids. Right. So now we would know for sure that our dipeptide was made out of glycine and alanine. Of course, in real life, you wouldn't just do a dipeptide, you'd do like an octopeptide, but we're starting with a simple example here. But we wouldn't know who came first. We wouldn't know if it's glyala or allogly. So now we have to start learning how to tell the order. Remember that we should always put the N terminus on the far left and the C terminus on the far right. So total acid hydrolysis can tell you what the composition was of your peptide, but it cannot tell you the ordering of your peptide. Very quickly. So sometimes those side chains were manipulating them, like we saw in the previous examples, and they were problematic. Will there be any ones where there will still be doing total acid hydrolysis, obviously, on some com more complicated mm -hmm. kind of um, mm -hmm. side chains, but yet they won't fit this criteria of being special, problematic ones? Um, it's very confusing, but... Because it can hydrolyze, you know, some other kind of side chains, not right, just. So, so the right. only side chains that can get hydrolyzed here are the asparagine and the glutamine. Really? Yeah. So we covered that's, the we that's covered the only, the only problem that issues for total acid hydrolysis. Okay. Yeah. And those are the only ones that could be. That's right. Now we said that um, cysteine and tryptophan, the entire amino acid is obliterated. It just doesn't appear at all. And we said that for glutamine and asparagine, the amino acid appears, but it's turned into something else. So there are it's no other molecules that have. No other naturally occurring amino acids. Okay. That's right. You can see that if you look at your table. If you run down the table, glutamine and asparagine are the only ones with amide side chains. Okay, and that's the only thing. And the total and acid hydrolysis. And, the, and, those, and the reason they're problematic is because they have amide side chains, which can be hydrolyzed. Well, these are not a problem. But even though they're not a problem, again, all the acid hydrolysis is telling us is that there's glycine and alanine, it's not telling us the order. So now we have to learn a trick for figuring out the order. Well, the trick we're going to learn is how to label the N terminus. We're going to learn a way to label the N terminus so that we can see which amino acid came from the N terminus. Uh, let's see, according to my notes, he went over, at least last he went over two ways to label the N terminus, damsel chloride and Sanger's reagent. Yeah. Okay? So there's these two ways to uh, label this. So I think the one that makes more sense is the Sanger's reagent, but they're basically the same. We'll go through the Sanger's reagent first. nitrogens nucleophiles? Yes. Yes. Is this carboxyoxygen a nucleophile? No. No. Also, even if you deprotonated it, it would still not be a good nucleophile because this negative charge is stabilized by resonance. So we should not think of this carboxy end as nucleophilic, whether it's protonated or not. We haven't talked about this before, but you should not think of this carboxy end as nucleophilic. Even if you deprotonate it so there's a negative charge, negative charges usually make things into nucleophiles, but this is not very nucleophilic because the negative charge is stabilized by resonance. You can still explain the resonance. That's right. The upshot is the amino end is nucleophilic in its neutral form, but the carboxy end is when not nucleophilic. When you resonate it, it will just be in the neutral on that O, right? Specifically. That's right. Okay. That's right. The negative charge is spread over both of these oxygens, so it's not in a big hurry to go someplace else. Before we saw there was right. a positive charge on it after we resonated, like on nitrogen. If this was an, an, from an amide, okay. So it's only the N terminus that's nucleophilic. All right. So what happens when we react the N terminus with the Sanger's reagent? Well, I think it's kind of intuitive here that this carbon is somewhat electrophilic. Notice that this carbon is attached to something very electronegative, this fluorine, so it has a big fat delta positive on it. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that this nitrogen would attack this carbon here, mm -hmm. kicking off the fluoride.
Okay, so after it attacks this, uh, what's it called, Sanger's reagent, we're going to get this. Okay? Um, and then, notice we have a positive charge in this nitrogen, but we might expect that then to deprotonate to get rid of the positive charge. So this is how this is usually formed, at, uh, how this is usually drawn after it attacks the Sanger's reagent. All right, by the way, I do not believe that this is the exact right mechanism. I think this is actually a two-step mechanism. First, the nitrogen attacks, then the fluoride leaves. Is that it's logical that the nitrogen would attack this carbon because the nitrogen is a nucleophile and this is an electrophilic carbon. Also, we don't usually think of fluorides as leaving groups, but I guess it's a good enough leaving group for this reaction. So we're just going to know that this reaction works. So would we expect this nitrogen to attack this electrophilic carbon? Yes, because amine nitrogens are nucleophiles. Would we expect this nitrogen to attack a Sanger's reagent? No, because it's an amide nitrogen. And would we expect the carboxy group to attack? No, because we've just discussed that carboxy groups are not nucleophiles. So only one, of the only one end will be labeled. Who will be labeled? The end terminus. This is our trick for labeling the end terminus. The end terminus is the thing that gets stuck with the Sanger's reagent. Okay, now we're going to do total acid hydrolysis. What will this look like after total acid hydrolysis? What will the computer see? This is what we're going to get after we do the total acid hydrolysis. It'll just hydrolyze this bond. Again, we don't have any problem amino acids here, so we'll just get very simple, two simple amino acids. And now, what will the computer report? The computer will see, it will say us, you know, I see an alanine, and I see a glycine with a Sanger's reagent attached. And then how will we, as intelligent scientists, interpret this? Well, we'll know that the glycine must have originally been at the end terminus of the original the peptide. Okay. It must have been at the far left, and the alanine was not at the far left. This is our first clue for figuring out the order of the amino acids. Now we can figure out who was at the far left, whoever was labeled with the Sanger's reagent. Does it matter what order in terms of Sanger's reagent being first and then, and then um, total acid hydrolysis? You got to do the Sanger's reagent first. And that would be an excellent test question. Because suppose that you added Sanger's reagent to this. Well, yeah, you got to do that first. Because re remember, the only reason the Sanger's reagent didn't oh, attach this right. nitrogen because it was buried in the amide. Right. Right. So you have to put in the Sanger's reagent. Well, first of all, the whole point of the Sanger's reagent is to figure out who's at the end terminus. Right. But after the total acid hydrolysis, there is right. no end terminus. Yeah. So the order is very important. You have to put in the Sanger's reagent while the amino acids are still connected to each other. Otherwise, there isn't an end terminus and then you do the total acid hydrolysis. And the key thing is that total acid hydrolysis will not break the Sanger's reagent off of the end terminus, so it'll still be labeled. This is our way of labeling our end terminus. Now this was unrealistic, because in real life, again, you wouldn't have a dyed peptide, you'd have maybe an octopeptide. So there would be a whole bunch of amino acids here. However, still, only one of them will have the Sanger's reagent. So you will know who was at the far left. That's the only thing this will tell you about the order. It won't tell you anything about the, except the far left. So this is a painstaking detective process where we figure out one little thing at a time about the molecule. Does it make any sense? Yeah. All right. Now, there's something else that would label the end terminus, which is denzel chloride. It's pretty much the same story. Again, denzel chloride is electrophilic, but there's only one good nucleophile here, which is the end terminus. Should I draw that on the board? Or do you have that in your notes? So. Okay. 